Good morning. Whoa. Did you hear that? All right. Good morning, everyone. We're excited to worship with y'all. Um, welcome online campus. We love y'all, wherever you're at, over there. Uh, welcome all you pastors who are here from out of town. We love you. Let's just posture our hearts to get ready for worship. So whatever way you need to do, kneel, raise your hands, whatever that is. Jesus, we declare that this entire service is for you, Lord. We minister to your heart, Jesus. We minister to your heart, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come. We humble ourselves before you. We set aside expectation. We set aside how we think this should go. And Lord, we say, let your name be glorified. Let your name be magnified. Yeah, let your name be glorified. Let your name be magnified, King Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your blood. Yeah. We thank you for your blood, Jesus. We thank you for your blood, Lord. We thank you for your blood, King Jesus. All of our attention's on you, Lord. All of our attention's on you, Jesus. All of our attention's on you, Lord. Yeah. Our attention is not on the band, it's not on the singers, it's not on the music, it's on you, Jesus. Our attention's on you, Jesus. Mm. Our attention's on you, Jesus. Lord, be magnified. Magnified. Lord, be glorified. Glorified. Lord, be magnified. Glorified, be magnified in this room. Be magnified, be glorified, be lifted up higher and higher and higher. Be lifted up higher and higher. every voice in the room. Sing, we exalt thee. right to him this morning.
sing in your heavenly language right now. We're not prophesying in tongues. We're just edifying our spirit, man. Come on. Begin to sing out in your heavenly language now. time, sing it again, we exalt thee.
Let the oil of gladness flow, flow, flow There is good news in the house of the Lord There is joy in the house of the Lord Let the oil of gladness flow, flow, flow There is good news in the house of the Lord There is joy in the house of the Lord Let the oil of gladness flow, flow, flow There is good news in the house of the Lord There is joy in the house of the Lord Let the oil of gladness flow, flow, flow There is good news in the house of the Lord There is joy in the house of the Lord
There's another wave coming. Another wave coming. Mm. Oh my, oh my goodness, oh my, the Lord is in this place. There's another wave coming. There's another wave. Come on, every hand lifted. Mm. Oh my, oh my goodness, oh my, the Lord is in this place. There's another wave coming. Another wave coming. Oh my, oh my goodness, oh my, His joy is in this place. There's another wave coming. There's another wave coming. Oh my, oh my goodness, oh my, the joy is in this place. There's another wave coming.
wants to hear that he is our joy 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 before says this therefore since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Real quick, we're about to enter into a freedom moment, into a joy moment. I don't know what sin was knocking at your door, what temptation was knocking at your door, but real quick, can you just, in his presence, repent for that thing and get it off of you? Some of you might need to take some shoes yeah, yeah. off, some jackets, way. some religion off, yeah, yeah. some weightiness from this week off, some doubt, some things that the enemy said, you're not going to fulfill this. <laughs> As you're repenting, let me keep going and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. How do we do this, church? Verse 2 says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Right now, you are transitioning your eyes off of that thing, yeah. off of that sin, off of that doubt, off of that sickness, off of that bad report, and setting them on Jesus, who the Bible says, for the joy, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame. Now seated in the place of honor at the right hand of our king. I don't know about you, but God hasn't put before me this week a cross that I have to be nailed to, a cross that I have to be crucified to. So I don't know what that thing is that the enemy tried to say to you. You couldn't move through it in ease and with joy. 
coming to your life. That whatever the enemy has said is too weighty, too hard, too great. <sighs> Lift your hands to heaven. Joy is in the room. Psalm 1611 says that the fullness of his joy is in his presence. The presence of the King, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords is in the room. Do I have any free people this morning that's ready to shake some chains of oppression, of doubt, of sickness? The laughter and joy is a weapon. Some of you real quick just need to laugh in the face of your enemy. It might feel weird at first, but all of a sudden you feel a shift where the enemy that had territory in your life no longer has it. We laugh in the face of your enemy. We laugh in the face of persecution. We laugh in the face of Jezebel and her confusion. We laugh in the face of Goliath and the giants of our time. We laugh. We laugh. Oh. We declare what David declared. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Tries to defy <laughs> the armies of the Almighty King, for God is on our side. Do not forget who is on your side. Thank you, Jesus, <laughs> that you are on our side and we are on your side. So, Father, our eyes shift back to you. Father, we thank you that your glory, your peace, your presence, your joy is in this place. Thank you that freedom and deliverance is in this place. We declare hail, King Jesus. <laughs> He's who rules and reigns. You rule and you reign. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence in this place. We give you all of the honor and all of the glory and all of the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. He's so good. He's so good. <laughs> and it's just the beginning. Uh, I'm Heather Shaw, senior pastor of Mercy Culture Church, where we love God, we love people, and we love mercy. Would you just enjoy? Hug somebody, say hello on your way back to your seat this morning.
Welcome to Mercy Culture, where you can encounter God with us at many campuses or online from anywhere. Our vision is to take people from corporate encounters with God to daily personal encounters with God. If this is your first time with us, we can't wait to meet you. Text the word NEW to 59090 so we can get to know you. For everyone who texts NEW, $10 will be donated to the Justice Reform, an organization that is answering the cry for justice by bringing reformation from city to city. MC Connect is your first step to joining and serving at Mercy Culture. But it's about more than membership. It's about daily personal encounters with God, discipleship, and community. Through MC Connect, you will learn more about our culture, how you best connect with God daily, and enter into the covering of Mercy Culture Church. For more information, text CONNECT to 59090. Here at Mercy Culture, we honor God by giving our first and our best through tithes and offerings. There are several ways you can give. Text GIVE followed by a dollar amount to the number on screen online at mercyculture.com slash give. And for physical offerings, you can use the boxes on your way out or send it by mail. Here's a look at what's coming up at Mercy Culture. For more information and to stay connected, follow us on social media, visit mercyculture.com or text news to 59090. morning, Mercy Culture. My name is Landon. I'm the senior lead pastor of Mercy Culture Church. The vision of our church is to take people from corporate encounters with God to daily personal encounters with God. And here's what that means is, is we are not just about a great church service, but we want you to encounter the presence of God every single day. Because when you get in the presence of God, it is so easy to hear him. When you begin to hear God and obey God, everything in your life begins to change. So here at Mercy Culture, we are passionate about God encounters that we want to help you connect with God on a daily basis. So we do this through our membership, which is really discipleship, and it's called Connect. And it's really, really simple. You can text Connect to the number that comes on the screen or go to mercyculture.com. You watch a few short videos about our church, and then you take this amazing Connect with God assessment. And here's what it does. It will show you how you best connect with God. Because here's the thing, is everyone connects with God differently. And when you learn how you best connect with God, it is a game changer for your spiritual growth. And this is why so many people have a hard time connecting with God because you're trying to connect with God like your pastor. And you may connect with God different than I do. But when you learn how you best connect with God, what happens is you will supernaturally begin to spiritually grow. And we want you to spiritually grow. So we want to encourage you, take that next step and go through Connect. Amen? Hey, our new album dropped this weekend, Mercy Culture's Joy. I would encourage you, play it in your house, play the songs of the house, share it, spread the word, and uh, it's amazing to see this, this go all over the world. Hey, uh, we have some special guests here today. We have 189 uh, leaders from 53 different churches that are here this weekend for pastor's impartation. These are individuals that have laid down their lives, that are building churches, presence-driven churches all over America. Come on, we're a house of honor. Would you stand to your feet and just honor the leaders, the pastors that are in this house? Come on, let them know Mercy Culture loves them. We're with them. And finally, if you want my notes, you can text notes to the number that comes on the screen and what's in front of me will be sent to you. How many ready to get in the word this morning? 2 Samuel chapter 6, 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, says this, As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings unto the Lord. Look at verse 20. And David returned to his household. 
He returned to bless his household, but Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. Here's what she said. How the king of Israel has honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of the servants, the female servants, as one of those vulgar fellows that shamelessly uncovers himself. David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me over your father. Above his house, he appointed me prince over Israel and the people of the Lord. Look at this. And I will celebrate. Someone say celebrate before the Lord. Verse 22. And I will make myself even more undignified or humiliated than even this. And I will abase, I will be abased in your eyes. By the female servants whom you've spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. Verse 23, look at this. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. I came to tell you this morning, joy is experienced in the pleasure of the Lord. The title of this message is Joy-Based Warfare. Let's pray. So Lord, we declare that your word is true, let every man be a liar. We declare, let your word go before us. We declare it's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Holy Spirit, I ask you to breathe upon your Logos word. I pray you would become Rhema right now. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to understand what your spirit is saying. Lord, we declare, Holy Spirit, we don't, we just say, have your way in this place. We say no spirit, but the Holy Spirit is welcome here. So we say, fear, you have to go. Any spirits of distraction, you have to go. Any spirits of intimidation, you have to go. Depression, you have to go. You must all bow. I declare, Holy Spirit, come, rule and reign. We declare, we don't make room for you, Holy Spirit, but we give you the entire room. Lord, I thank you. No one came to hear me. We all came to hear you. So we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, we are stewarding a prophetic word of the year, a year of dunamis. It's a year that he will strengthen us and he will fortify us. Dunamis is when the Holy Spirit goes from resting on you to dwelling or abiding in you. We're also stewarding some prophetic words over our house. One of the prophetic words that the Lord released at the beginning of the year over our house was it was a year that joy is our weapon. That joy is our warfare. We're in the middle of a spontaneous spiritual warfare series. Remember when I got up here at the beginning of the year and I showed you what we're going to teach over the year? There was a timeline of what we're going to teach. Well, part of that timeline is we would have specific services or specific messages on spiritual warfare throughout the year. This is that first one. And before we begin to talk about the the joy-based warfare, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page when it comes to spiritual warfare. What is spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is the war over the will of man. That's what spiritual warfare is. The war that is over your ability to deny your flesh and say yes to the Spirit of God. Spiritual warfare is a war over your obedience. Tell your neighbor he's talking to you. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. 2 Corinthians 2, 11 says, For we are not unaware of the enemy's schemes. So we have to be aware of what the enemy's doing. How are you aware of what the enemy's doing? Like for instance, when we're in a service where we're talking about spiritual warfare, there's a good chance that you encountered spiritual warfare this week. I know I did. When you're in a service, when you're talking about spiritual warfare, there will most likely be those that want to come and distract. How do you distract? You take attention off God and bring it on yourself. So the worst thing that you can do in a service like this is draw any attention onto yourself. Where the best thing that you can do is give all attention to God. 
So watch, if we're in a church service and every single one of us are shouting joy with everything in our we have and dancing before the Lord with everything we have, that's in perfect order. But if you take it upon yourself to stand up and say, my little children, and give a little fake prophecy, and you're out, that would be out of order. So the best thing you could do is give all attention to God. The worst thing that you can do is take attention on yourself. But unfortunately in the church, we've wanted to ignore spiritual warfare because it could be a little messy or it could be a little awkward or it could be a little demonic. And, and so we would rather pretend that there are no demons and then go to the doctor to help us fight spiritual warfare. This is the way of the church in America. You know, there's no demons in America. They're just, they're in other, you know, third world nations. Obviously, you haven't partip- participated in politics where most of the demons reside. So it's really important that you understand proper spiritual warfare. There's two messages that we've taught at Mercy Culture that I would encourage every member of our church to go back and listen to. The first is called uh, Unseating Principalities. And this is our spiritual warfare philosophy. It's on our YouTube or on our podcast. And here's the thing is we don't go around challenging high-ranking demonic forces. How you engage in spiritual warfare is by lifting up the highest authority. You lift up Jesus and you let Jesus fight your battles for you. The second one I want you to be aware of, it was the number one listened to sermon last year. It was called fear-based warfare. What is fear-based warfare? Fear-based warfare is we do not engage into spiritual warfare being led by a spirit of fear. It's why so many churches fell or, or, or struggled in, in COVID season because they were trying to engage spiritual warfare with fear. They called it wisdom, but it was really fear. God will not honor fear-based decisions, fear-based leadership, or fear-based warfare. So how do we engage in fear-based warfare? We fear God more. We honor him and he will honor that warfare. Today is really a part two, but there's more to it than that. But after we remove fear from spiritual warfare, we have to have something to replace it. And here's the thing is spiritual warfare is one in the joy of the Lord. Someone say joy. If I'm honest with you, this is something that I have struggled with throughout my life where we have tried to sum up joy as a feeling or a personality or, or, or we've tried to make it about these other things other than what it truly, truly is. But joy has been something that, that I've been attacked with. My joy has been attacked. And for years, my wife has said to me privately and, and when we're on our marriage retreat, Landon, you need more joy, you need more joy. And, and, and honestly, when I heard her say it, I heard blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I, I'm not... I'm not dishonoring what my wife was saying. I'm saying until you get a revelation of joy, you sit in church services and you just hear blah, blah, blah. Everybody turned to blah, blah, blah. This is where Jesus said blah, blah, blah. And and, and, and you just don't get it. You need a revelation of joy. Now, some of you are like my wife and you just have automatic joy. You're just happy. Like she's the life of the party. I'm the end of the party. So many people are like, oh, it'd be so cool if I was friends with Pastor Landon. We could ride motorcycles and hang out. Like, no, you don't. I'm not a party animal. I'm the party closer. I'm a party pooper. I show up to the party wondering what time the party's going to be over. I'm negotiating with the joy person in the car. Like, okay, we're here for an hour, one hour. Here's the alarm. I'm setting your alarm. When you hear the buzzer go off, when I stand up, when I clear my throat twice, you're coming. (laughs) Pure hell is going to Disneyland with my wife. (laughs) That's before we knew about all the grooming. We don't go anymore. Anyway, okay, you can go. We're not going. Anyway, that's a different sermon. That's a different spiritual warfare sermon. I have struggled with this. And maybe you're like my wife and you're naturally a a, a joyous, have fun, go with the flow person. But you know what? I've also seen her joy get attacked. 
where she goes from naturally joyful to frustrated all the time. And so, but I see this strategic plan of the enemy to attack people's joy. There's over 53 churches represented this weekend for pastor's impartation. Do you know what I know about your pastor? you pastors? Your joy is attacked. Because a lot of pastors need to go and they're pulling themselves off the floor of depression on Monday morning. Because churches are built around the, uh, them and not the presence of God. The enemy is going to attack you. It doesn't matter. He's no respecter of persons. He doesn't care if you're the pastor of this house. He doesn't care if you're a serve team member. He doesn't care if you're a leader. He doesn't care if you're a first time visitor. All of us get attacked with our joy. Do you know that they just did a study in 2023 that 22% of Americans are struggling with depression? 22%. How many were a part of that survey? I wasn't. That's just the people that admitted to it. They say 320 million people worldwide are struggling with depression. Watch, this is not something that is going to just go away. This is demonic. How do you know it's demonic? Because you could be doing great, have one conversation with one Jezebel, one spirit of offense, one situation. All of a sudden you go from doing great, want to take on the world, world to giving up, leaving your church, absolutely abandoning the call of God on your life. You don't think that's spiritual? There is a war in the spirit over joy. And here what it is. It is spiritual. It is spiritual. So this journey started for me years ago as Heather kept saying, you need joy, you need joy, you need joy. And I just hadn't gotten it. And she was hearing so far in front of me what the Lord was saying. And I needed an encounter with God to get it. So if I just, one of our values is authenticity. If I could just be honest with you, last year was a challenging year. There was 38 articles written negatively about us. 38 articles. News outlets, pastor breaking the law, defying IRS, chat rooms started about us, all sorts of stuff, just constantly, constantly, constantly. I, I would hear them and, and, and I'd, I'd feel anxiety. I'd feel spiritual warfare. There's a group that live up in this neighborhood that are trying to stop, they won't succeed, but they were trying to stop us from building the justice residences on our property. A demon possessed group of people, you say, pastor, why would you say that? Because only demons would do that. Say, pastor, that's not being nice. Scripture doesn't say to be nice to demons. It says to honor demons. Put them in the appropriate place of value. And if you identifying with partner with demons to try to stop us from helping people that have been victims of human trafficking, then that is on you. All of this nonstop resistance. And then which I, just for all the pastors in the room, they won't resist you as long as you stay in your church and mind your business. So we go through this intense part of the year. I haven't even got to start preaching. It's easy in his presence yet. And we do a presbytery service. And our apostolic elders come and prophesy. Pastor Tom Lane, one of our apostolic elders, one of the elders of Gateway, he's not able to be there in person, but he was so kind to send a prophetic word. I thought it was kind till I heard it. And I didn't have a chance to listen to it ahead of time. It's probably a good thing. And I'm standing right over here on the platform listening to the prophetic word. And Pastor Tom says, I'm going to warn you, Mercy Culture, that over the next 18 to 24 months, you are going to experience unresist uh, unprecedented resistance. I'm like, false prophet. <laughs> I knew it. I knew Tom was. I knew he was. The first thing I think is great. It's already been a jolly good year, 30, 30 articles at that time. All right, so we've already had unprecedented resistance. Next thing I thought is, well, maybe Tom got his spiritual wires crossed and maybe he didn't realize that the unprecedented resistance started 12 months ago. So maybe we're already 12 months into it. So maybe his timeline is a little off. And I'm sitting there and finally I just think, oh, whatever. Now, now, hold on a second. Hold on. Don't judge me. That's not a, I'm ignoring it, whatever. It's like, whatever, whatever. Like, let's go. All right, bring it on. Come on, let's go. So 
Two weeks later, I'm in this sanctuary and we bring all of the teachers of MC prep for a week before the school season starts, the school year starts, and we call it Holy Spirit Week. And it's just a week of encountering God for the teachers before they deal with your children. <laughs> Maybe it should be two weeks next year. Just say it, just say it. Okay, so we're in here praying and we're worshiping. And then all of a sudden I see a vision. What is a vision? It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual daydream. So God shows me something and he's speaking to me through a vision. And all of a sudden I see a timeline of 18 to 24 months. And in the timeline, I see unprecedented resistance moving on the timeline of 18 to 24 months. Then the next thing I see, the only way I can describe it is it looked like a sticker where I saw God take a sticker and over the 18 to 24 months, he just put joy. <laughs> then I see joy moving on the timeline of 18 to 24 months. And no longer did I see 18 to 24 months of unprecedented resistance, but I saw 18 to 24 months of unprecedented joy. Someone shout joy. Here's what I heard the Lord say. He showed me in that moment that we would dance from conference into the new year. And he told me, he said, I'm gonna give you the revelation of joy-based warfare. How many, ready to learn, how many ready to learn about joy? This is wild. Joy is one of the most simple words you could ever preach about. It's three letters. But in my over 20 years of ministry from a pulpit, I have never studied a more complicated and extensive root word. The etymology of joy was the most expansive family root system of words of anything I've ever studied in my entire life. When you're studying Hebrew and Greek, typically there's one root word that links to a word and there's some subcategories, but there's usually just one root word. This one had like six to it. It was this massive amount of words and meanings that made up joy. See, because it's something that we could be so familiar with the word that's so simple, but not have the revelation behind it. Holy Spirit, give us the revelation of joy. What is joy? Joy in the Hebrew is the word simcha, which means joy or gladness and overflow. Majority of the words connected to joy are gladness, happiness, celebration, and grace. There's a word called shashan, which means gladness or an exaltation or to ex exalt or display joy. This is wild. Because two weeks ago I was in my bathroom and I heard the Lord speak to me and he said, exalt me. I'm like, now? <laughs> and I had a vision of us on Sunday morning exalting the Lord, singing, I exalt thee. So I called our worship team. I called Danny and Pastor Jazz and I was like, hey guys, we need to start out this joy service by exalting the Lord. Then I went in as I was studying joy, I saw Shashan, which literally means exalting him. Watch, because as we exalt him, we are lifting up joy, the banner of joy over us as we worship. Then in the Greek, we see hara, which means to delight or watch this. It's the source of your joy. Delighting yourself in the Lord is a source of joy. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, your words were found and I ate them. And your words became to me joy and delight. We also see the word haro, which means I rejoice or be glad or in meeting people and coming and going. We see this with Mary and Elizabeth where, where John the Baptist and Elizabeth were full of the Holy Spirit and joy when they came in the presence. Then we see also connected to that same word is thrive. Ah, this is so important because you will spiritually thrive in an atmosphere of joy. It's also closely related to the word haro which means to rejoice and be glad in, or haris, which means grace. This is wild. So we know grace means un unmerited favor or when God leans towards us. 
But do you know when you are engaging in joy, God himself is leaning towards you. Joy is not a feeling. It is not an emotion. Watch, it is a spiritual state. Let me give you my personal definition. It's the result of encountering God's mercy in the evidence of abiding in him. See, joy is when you love God and you know you are loved by God. First Peter 1 Peter 1.8 says this, though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not know, see him, you believe in him and you are filled with inaccessible and glorious joy. Let me give you some practical advice. How do you partner with joy? You partner with joy by leaping, Luke 6. By shouting, Isaiah 55. By singing, Psalms 98. By laughing, Psalms 126. By playing music, almost all of the Psalms, but Psalms 98, 6. Or by dancing, Psalms 30. You know what's wild? Is how many people have no problem dancing outside of God's house, but have a problem with dancing inside God's house. Oh, you tear it up at the wedding. And it was a Christian wedding. They had sparkling cider and you still were tipsy. Or even worse, you're at Billy Bob's. I'm not even talking about the backslidden lukewarm that are on the clubs on the weekend. Or even the worst, you know what the worst is? The worst, the worst, the worst is when you see people dancing at political rallies. Like you just start cringing. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, you're melting as, no, but watch. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come back, come back, come back. So hold on, you got no problems. As soon as they play your old song that you spiritually connect with. I'm not talking to young people, I'm talking about you, Grandma, staying alive. We know you got a testimony, Grandma. But the moment we get into a church setting, all of a sudden, oh. Like I felt the spirit move. How many scriptures do you need to support it? Well, that stuff's not for me. Oh, you mean the kingdom of God is not for you? Hold on a second. Because there's over 300 times the word joy is used. That's just the word joy. That doesn't count joyful. That doesn't count uh, 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 joyous. That doesn't count celebration. That doesn't count gladness, these other things. Just that. And let me give you one of the greatest scriptures on joy. Romans 14, 7. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking. Look at this. But righteousness, peace, and someone say it. In the Holy Ghost. Watch this. One third of the kingdom is joy. Now watch, that means heaven is made up of joy. And when he brings his kingdom to earth, it's made up of joy. Watch, what you are trying, what you are really saying is I will not participate in the kingdom of heaven. Joy is a fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5, 22. Fruit of the spirit is love. Number two. Joy. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? It is the evidence or the fruit that you have relationship with the Holy Spirit. It is a fruit. Joy is a part of your daily encounter or connecting with God. Psalms 118, 24. This is the day the Lord has made. I will or let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know what day joy day is? Every day. Every day is joy day. Why are you having bad days all the time when it's joy day? The only thing better than joy day is deliverance day, but deliverance happens in joy, so joy is the one that brings on deliverance. 
You know what a problem with your depressing day is that you partnered with? Is you call all these days, oh, Monday's this day, Tuesday's this day, Wednesday's this day. You've made a partnership with demonic forces when God says, no, this day is the Lord's. This day is joy. This day I will celebrate. Every day is joy day. Do you know what joy releases in awnings? Hebrews 1.9. You have loved righteousness, hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness or joy. Danny Frischmith has this anointing of joy on his life. You know what you need to do? Let me give you some practical advice. When, when, when you meet someone with joy, you need to ask them to pray for you. When Heather told me for two years I didn't have joy and I started realizing I need joy, when I started seeing joy by spirit-filled people, I started asking them to pray for me. When I came back from that, from that time of rest and, and, and I got that depressing prophetic word, just kidding, it was that exciting prophetic word by, by Pastor Tom. I was like, all right, I need some joy. I need some joy. And I ran into uh, Will Ford. And as soon as I saw Will Ford, he just starts jumping like this. <laughs> we didn't even say anything. He just started jumping up and down smiling. And I was like, he's got joy. <laughs> I went straight up to him. I was like, Will, I don't need to talk to you. Just pray joy over me. <laughs> I was like, joy, anoint me with joy. I was in Washington, D.C. with Sean Foyt. Sean Foyt's got an anointing of joy on his life. I said, Sean, we're talking to him. He's like, hey, I need you to meet my pastor. Man, he's the most joyful person I ever met. I said, can you pray for me? You think I'm joking. If there's an anointing of joy, I want all of it that I can get. I want as much oil on my head, an anointing that is on my head. Somebody needs to start walking around this church when you see people with joy. Just pray for me. We're not at the altar. Perfect. Just pray. I need joy. There's an anointing for it. You know what that anointing does? Makes you stronger. Nehemiah 8.10 says this, and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Some of you wonder why you're so spiritually weak and you fall into the same sins all the time because you need to be anointed with joy. Joy will cause you to partner with the word dunamis and it will strengthen and fortify you. It will deliver you. Jeremiah 31, 13 says, I will turn their mourning into joy. This is what's important is you don't realize when you're delivered from it. And just, if you haven't heard us teach on deliverance, you can go watch Heather's message from two weeks when she taught on deliverance and bondage. Uh, it's important you understand, listen, deliverance isn't because you're bad. Deliverance is because God's good. I get delivered a few times a year. It is so good for me. We had the responsibility dinner last Friday for the justice reform, and I got delivered at the responsibility dinner. Yeah. You don't have to be excited. I was excited. I got delivered. I felt, I felt a layer of fear shed off me. Y'all, I'm not that fearful of a person. I don't really struggle with that much fear. Fear is not like one of my go-to like things that attacks me, but it was on me and I felt it come off me in that moment. Listen, deliverance is when God just blesses you and says, hey, that burden that's on you, I'm gonna take it off you. Hey, that thing that's been tormenting you, I'm gonna lift it off you. Hey, just because you're in my presence, I'm gonna give you this gift of joy. So watch, around here we steward prophetic words. So when prophetic words come, we don't just let them go. We make sure that we're doing them. We're walking in them. We're praying in them. We're being practical with them. So when the Lord said that we would dance our way from conference into 2023, y'all, we danced. And I don't know if you were at Mercy Culture Conference, but I was there and I got delivered. Now here's the wild part is I can't tell you when. I don't know what happened. The whole thing was just bananas. It was just this outpouring for days. It was just the glory of God. And I don't know what is the time when I was dancing with my shoes off or without my shoes off. Is all I know is the whole weekend I was sweaty. But there's this one moment where I realized, watch, I was delivered. Now this is, this is important because some of you see people dancing and you harden your heart and you don't realize what kind of deliverance is taking place. You see people laughing, you see people shouting, you see people singing, you saw someone twirling around and part of you is like, is that really necessary? It depends if you've been delivered or not. I didn't realize I was delivered till a month later. Heather and I are on a marriage retreat, just a little 
practical advice for marriage retreats on intimacy. I'll just rate her a little lower sometimes just to... <laughs> you got to go watch the marriage retreat thing. It's just a strategy, guys. Just a strategy thing, okay? Okay. Holy Spirit, come back. Holy Spirit, come back. <laughs> so... We're on our marriage retreat and we're taking a break from our topics at hand and, and, and she's doing some shopping and I'm at a, a coffee shop and someone sends me an article that just came out. I'm not sure if it was number 38 or 37, but another article that just came out. And this was the article that, I, that was sent to me. North Texas pastor defies IRS over political endorsements from the pulpit. Big whoop. <laughs> now, when I read the 36th article, and the 35th article, and the 25th article, and when I saw those headlines, I would feel witchcraft and anxiety. I would feel the source behind the articles attacking us. But when I read this one in a coffee shop with my headphones in, I started belly laughing. <laughs> Tears running down my face as I'm laughing, reading Big Whoop. <laughs> Wiping the tears from my face, I realized I was delivered. I knew somewhere in conference, I danced my way into the deliverance of joy. Guys, I'm telling you, you might not know when it is, but you will dance your way into deliverance when you understand the revelation of joy. Someone shout joy. So in the Old Testament, we saw joy connected to victories like with the army. You see this in 1 Samuel 18 where David killed Goliath. They were all rejoicing and they sang songs like David or Saul has slain thousand, but David his tens of thousands. But in the New Testament, it shifts very fast and we see how spiritual joy is. Luke 10, 17, the 72 disciples came back and they returned with joy saying, Lord, look at even demons are subject to us in our name. They started engaging in spiritual warfare and realized that there was joy in it. You have to understand this church that there is an attack on your joy. It's not just my joy. It's not just Heather's joy. It's not the pastor's joy that's in this room, but there is an attack on all of our joy. We see it in Psalms 51. Even the giant slayer had to be attacked or was attacked with joy. And here's what he's saying. Restore to me, look at this, the joy of my salvation. Even the one they were singing the songs about, his joy was attacked. How do you know your joy is being attacked? You stop caring about people getting saved. People coming up, the pastor's making an altar call and you're like, is this over yet? Even though Luke says all of heaven is rejoicing, but you're not. How do you know your joy is being attacked? You don't celebrate revival fires that are springing up around the nation. You have guilty till proven innocent, all of a sudden spirit of religion on you. Doesn't matter how many times I warn you from the pulpit about the spiritual religion, you're participating with it because someone claims to be a pastor online, but all of a sudden why, well, we just gotta use discernment. Well, where's your discernment in COVID? All of a sudden you got a gift of discernment? Where's that been? Oh, you mean when the Holy Spirit's moving, you need discernment. How come you haven't discerned why it hasn't moved in your church ever? Oh, but now you need discernment. Watch, this will attack. It comes to attack to stop joy from coming because the Lord or the enemy knows what will happen when your joy is attacked. If you can let go of your joy, then you will let go of your power. When does he attack? He attacks through hardships. You notice the enemy, he's, he doesn't play fair. He never announces when he's coming. He's not like, hey, guess, hey, in two weeks, I know you just had a great conference. And so, so I'm not gonna attack you now, but, but come February when conference is out of your system, I'm coming. He doesn't announce it then. He doesn't give you forewarning. 
Watch, he attacks through hardships. He attacks through trials. He attacks through tribulations. Watch, he attacks through disappointments. He attacks through a spirit of frustration. He attacks through a spirit of offense. He'll attack through the media and try to placate on your old pain of yesterday. Even though you've been set free, delivered, your new creation, he'll try to attack you on the attacks that worked yesterday just to see if they still work for you. Those temptations, those distractions, that spirit of lust, whatever it is, he will try to wait he can. Let me be clear. The enemy doesn't care if you're gay. He doesn't care if you're straight. He doesn't care how perverted you are. He doesn't care what you struggle with. He just cares that he has you. And whatever he can get to stick, this is where the attacks come. Attacks come in hardships. And that's usually where people let go of joy. But the apostle Paul didn't. Romans chapter 5, watch this. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Ho, ho, ho. Scripture says we don't rejoice during just mercy culture joy services. No, 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 we don't rejoice when everybody's rejoicing with us. Scripture says, well, this is the place we rejoice. In the middle of suffering. In the middle of betrayal. In the middle of attacks. In the middle of persecution. Watch, and the enemy has tricked you to think you stop during those times. That's not when you stop. Y'all, that's when you turn it up. We don't stop in those, watch, the Apostle Paul taught us. He showed us, you're like, well, that's cute for the Apostle Paul. Do you know who we're talking about? You know what's wild? The Apostle Paul was known as the theologian of joy. Out of all the scriptures in the New Testament, 30% of them, or excuse me, 40% of them were written by him on joy. He was the one constantly talking about joy. And outside of Jesus, from a biblical perspective, no one suffered more than him. Shipwrecks, imprisonments, beatings, betrayals, imprisonment, over and over and over and over. And like Heather preached a few weeks ago, they would find him in prison. He wasn't depressed, pastor. He was full of joy, worshiping, jailers getting saved. He wasn't depressed when his ministry got diverted in a shipwreck. He led everybody to the Lord. Lord on the island. Listen, he was not afraid of suffering. You got to hear this. There's an anointing of joy coming because this is a year to strengthen and, f- strengthen and fortify. Watch, and the church is soft. You're soft. We're soft because we lost our joy. Oh, I told you I got delivered. Oh, I love getting delivered. I love getting delivered. I, 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 I was at the Justice Reform Residence Dinner, the Responsibility Dinner, the thing. I gave my all last service, so I'm tired. Listen, I, 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 I was at the thing. And I heard the Lord speak to me. Why are you going easy? Here's what I heard him speak to me. He said, there was only 38 articles. I was like, oh my gosh. If this could happen when it's just a few of us that are a bit ornery, if if this could happen with a few of us being bold, What might happen after thousands just fasted for 40 days? What would happen after thousands would stand up and get bold and get loud? What happens when your podcast starts going viral? What happens when you start running? What happens when you get in city council? What happens when you take a stand? We're on the fault line right now because right now it's your pastors that are bold. What happens when you get bold? 
Watch. What happens when you don't care about getting the business deal, you'll speak the truth in love anyway. What happens when you're not afraid about losing friends anymore, you'll speak grace and truth. What happens when you shed a layer of fear? I feel the Lord, this entire church, this entire service is about to shed a layer of fear today. Somebody shout joy. Watch, 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 watch. Then Paul writes, put it up, Philippians 4, 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord. What does it say? What does it say? Do you know where Philippians is written? See, this is a problem when you just read scripture because you don't know the context of it. Paul is writing in a Roman prison, awaiting his execution. Theologians, historians believe Paul died between 64 AD and 68 AD. Philippians was written in 64 AD. He is facing his execution. He's not de deconstructing. He's not starting his Feel Bad For Me podcast from church hurt wounds. Watch, he's not church hopping because his pastor said, get in the fight. Listen, he's not complaining about the itching ears teaching and preaching. Watch, in the middle of facing execution. He's, I don't know if he was talking to the church or Satan. where he says, if you think you can stop me from rejoicing, I thought the last prison break would have taught you that shackles won't stop my joy, that imprisonment won't stop my joy, that losing friends and followers won't stop my joy. Nothing, no demonic attack can take away my joy. He's so stinking bold. He says, after I rejoice, guess what I'm going to do after I rejoice? I'm going to rejoice again, and I'm going to rejoice again. Watch, no matter what I'm going through, I don't care if the doctor said cancer, I'm rejoicing. I don't care if they said you're dying, I'm going to rejoice. I don't care what the assignment of the enemy is. Uh, he's after our joy. Because the enemy thinks if you suffer, you will curse him. You will turn on him. See, Paul was saying, I will rejoice no matter what my circumstance is because I can be in the presence of God no matter what my circumstance is. Many of you know and love Pastor Matt and Maggie Wakefield, we love them dearly. And you know, many of you, what they just went through. For last month, we were believing, standing in faith, praying, fasting for their baby girl, Justice, to live. And the baby was born, and 10 days later, the baby died. We did all that we knew how to do to stand in faith. We're at a funeral service. No one has the right words to say in that environment. The only thing we know to do is love God and love each other. And we're in the middle of this worship service. And the Wakefields has a four-year-old daughter, a four-year-old son. And their daughter, in the middle of a funeral service, when over 100 pastors don't know what to do, their four-year-old daughter begins to dance. Put that picture up. And in front of a casket this big, she dances. 
and I'm watching this four-year-old little girl dance, and I keep thinking, you're not supposed to do that at funerals. But the four-year-old little girl didn't realize she was at a funeral. She just was aware she was in the presence of God. So if she's over at MC Prep in the four-year-old class and they play worship and they begin to dance, or if she's in MC Kids and they begin to worship and she begins to dance, or if she's in the service with her mommy and daddy and the worship of God begins to flow, she begins to dance, or she's at a funeral of her sister, she begins to dance, and then I realize that her parents already named her prophetically because their four-year-old baby girl's name is Joy, and nothing else could interrupt this moment with an atmosphere of the presence of God like Joy could. You say, where is God in the sufferings? He'll dance with you in the sufferings. He'll dance with you in the trial. He'll dance with you in betrayal. He'll dance with you in hard times. His presence will meet you in his joy. I'm reminded of the story of Luke. Chapter 3, where Mary is pregnant with Jesus... Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. Put the scripture up. And the moment Mary comes into the presence of Elizabeth, the Bible says the baby in her womb leaped. They were both baptized in the Holy Spirit, which will break your little my choice, my body mindset. They were both baptized in the Holy Spirit and a baby in the womb. Put that in your theological concepts. It's full of the Holy Spirit. Watch, 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 watch. The moment a baby in the womb is full of the Holy Spirit, the first response is joy. I'm trying to tell you, no matter what situation that you find yourself in, when you come into the presence of Jesus, when you find yourself in the presence of Jesus, it doesn't matter if it's a funeral like the Wakefields or a prison like the Apostle Paul. Despite your situation, you have access to joy by access of the presence of God. And this is where you watch joy become dunamis. When I preached on dunamis, we talked about John chapter 15. That if you abide in him, he'll abide in you. If you remain in him, he'll remain in you. You will bear much fruit. Well, if you look at the end of John chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, it says, these things have been spoken to you. Watch, that your joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Oh. Some of you don't have a f joy problem. You have a full problem where you don't fill up on joy. You're watching your joy wait. I don't want to be too joyful. I don't want to, I'm, I don't want to get sweaty. I don't, I don't want to look bad. I don't know how I will, I, I, me, me, I, I, I wonder why I'm so depressed. I wonder why I have anxiety. I wonder why I'm afraid. I wonder why I'm battling this spiritual warfare. Watch, you are empty of joy. Ah. Turn to your neighbor and say, drink up. This morning, you're about to get full of joy's dunamis power because what happens is, is when you begin to abide in joy, it becomes dunamis and you become full of joy. You become complete in joy. Watch, his power is released. Ah, so how do you get this joy? Question, how do you remain in joy? How does this work? I know you know we, you need it now. I know you know that there's a warfare over it now. This isn't about emotions. It's not about feelings. It's not about personalities anymore. This is spiritual war. And I'm kind of a simple guy. And I see these great preachers and these orators and they break down the exegesis and this and this and this and they're so poetic and their sermons are so cute.
Like, Lord, I wish I could be a cute preacher. <laughs> but I'm kind of just a simple guy. I'm like, Lord, I don't understand. Can you just show me? I said, Lord, how, how do I get your joy? He said, Landon, it's my pleasure. I was doing that, mama. I was like, whoa. I, I know what you're talking about now. Because I felt it for the first time in 2014 when I obeyed the Lord with the year assignment for the entire year. And I got down on my knees after the last service that I obeyed God. And I felt his pleasure come on me like a blanket. I felt it as we begin to plant mercy culture and we're like, we're not building a church around a person. We're not building around a man. We're gonna build around the presence of God. And then he started coming and I started feeling his pleasure. I remember feeling the pleasure of the Lord as I'm at Pastor Steve's mayoral campaign losing party where he didn't win. <laughs> they called it a victory party, but you didn't win. So it's not, a, it's not a victory party. And I remember sitting in the back. I feel joy in the room. And he loses. And I feel his pleasure. That we would say yes. And I heard the Lord say, you never lose when you obey me. I felt, watch, his pleasure. I felt his pleasure dancing in conference. I feel his pleasure in board meetings where we say we're not going to do what everyone says we're supposed to do. I felt his pleasure as people told me, if you plant your church like this with too long of services, people aren't going to come. Landon, you're over spiritual. Landon, you're not going to have people want to come. And I said, I could care less if they come. I care if he comes. I need his presence. I felt his pleasure. We don't care if you like the songs or not. We don't care if you like the worship or not. Watch, it's not about your joy. It's about his pleasure. Oh, this is a breakthrough because I don't have to feel a certain way. I don't have to be the life of the party. I don't have to have a certain disposition. The only thing I have to worry about is find out what God's doing and then partner with him in it. Watch, if you want, poly if you want government, we'll go get government for you. If you want a justice residence, we'll build a justice residence for you. If you want the arts and entertainment, we'll go fight for them for you. God, what do you want? What brings him joy? You want a food bank to feed thousands of people a week? We'll do whatever you want. If you want a pastor's network to pour in a pastor's, we'll do whatever you want. Father, whatever you tell us to do, what you want my money, you got it. You want my time, you got it. You want my reputation, you got it. Whatever you want. When you understand, joy is only in pleasing. And then I feel his pleasure. And I want to run through walls. I want to conquer cities. There's nothing I won't do. Watch when I feel his pleasure. Reminds me of David. You may be seated. 2 Samuel chapter 6, where David is feeling the pleasure of the Lord. Why is he feeling the pleasure of the Lord? Because he went and got the presence of God. After Saul let it go be an abandoned in the enemy's camp for decades, David said, it's the first order of king. I'm going to go get it. He goes and gets it. I talk about this in Deuteronomy. What happens? Uzzah touched the ark. They didn't do it with the fear of the Lord. Uzzah dropped dead. David freaked out. He said, this is going to work. He went back and found out, okay, we have to do this with reverence. We can't put it on a card. It's got to be carried by men because the presence of God has to be carried by men. Then they brought it into the city, took six steps, stopped and praised and offering every time. And then they got the Ark of the Covenant into the city. So David starts rejoicing because God is rejoicing. So he feels the pleasure of the Lord. So as he's feeling the pleasure of the Lord, he rips off his royal groves. He takes off his crown and he dances like a man. But I think his wife was a celebrity pastor. And she stood in the window and she looked down at him and she said, you're making us look bad. You're making my dad look bad. You're making me look bad. We don't dance like common people. We don't worship. We have worshipers that worship before we minister. We don't worship. We don't do that. We don't act like that. We don't lower ourselves. We have a reputation.
And David said, if you think I'm dancing now, I just got the ark back. He said, baby, you haven't seen anything yet because I will be even more abased. I will be even more undignified. I will humiliate myself even more. If you think what other churches care, we care about what other churches think about us. If you think about what, if we care about what other pastors think about us. If you think we care what politicians think about us. If you think we care. The only thing I care about does he like it when I dance for him? Watch this, watch this, watch this. Put the scripture up. He says, he came to bless his wife, 2 Samuel 6. He came to bless her. That was the motivation of him coming. But as he's coming with a blessing, she starts speaking curses. He rebukes her. And the last verse says this. <laughs> Look at verse 23, put it up on the screen. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children until the day of her death. Now, theologians don't know, did she become spiritually barren in that moment? Or did he never have intimacy with her again? But the result was the same. She did not give birth to anything. When you don't celebrate what God is celebrating. You won't give birth to spiritual things. Watch this, watch this, watch this. It's the morning of Roe v. Wade being overturned. I'm in my office and I hear this shout, cry, whimper, squeal all at once. And I came running to my wife's office to see what was wrong. And she's weeping mascara everywhere. And she says, it's overturned. Cries and shout went from her office into the first service of Mark's Women Conference where this place exploded. <laughs> Tears and crying and shouting and losing our voices. And then we got on social media to see what the rest of the world was going to be celebrating with us. And it was silent. And fake, woke, celebrity Pastors all over the country were saying things like, this is not the time to celebrate. Excuse me, you're not a pastor, you're a wolf. This is not the time to celebrate. Hold on, hold on. When the Lord answered decades of prayers, when the death decree over our nation is overturned, what's when prophetic alignments are coming and a Supreme Court overrules this, when this moment which seemed to be impossible, all of a sudden came possible. Wait, this is not the time to celebrate? And I ask you, when is? And I could not believe what I heard by individuals that I thought were spiritual leaders, but they're profiteers. They're motivational speakers with a Bible in their hand. They're itching ears teachers that please man and won't disturb our audience. They go below the radar. They don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't want to make anyone upset. They've abandoned truth and have just settled for an extreme grace that's no longer biblical because more than anything like Saul, they just want people to like him. 
Because maybe if you like me, maybe I'll feel better about myself. And because I haven't partnered with the joy of the Lord and what God is rejoicing in, I need to find something to make me feel better about myself. So what can I say to appease your ears so you will tell me I'm important? And I heard the Lord speak to me. And he told me to rebuke you. And so I come as a loving father, as a kind shepherd. I come with love in my heart to say, some of you let the wolves silence you. And some of you did not partner with the prophetic word of expanding territory and getting loud. Your church got loud and you got quieter. And you let the spirit of fear that you didn't get shed of yet. I heard the Lord when we ran, when I ran over here during the first part of my sermon, I heard the Lord say, they're going to shed fear today. And you didn't realize, but as people were celebrating, when I said Roe was to overturn and you started shouting, that was a spiritual moment where God was doing something. Ha, because here's the thing. Some of you missed your opportunity. You didn't celebrate. You allowed the enemy to come in and manipulate. You partnered with deception. And some of you were even voices of deception, but it wasn't in your heart. You were just being used of the enemy. It reminds me of Peter who betrayed Jesus three times and he didn't mean to, he didn't want to, but he just fell into to a trap because Satan asked to sift him as wheat but he met with Jesus on a beach and he said do you love me if you love me you're not afraid of their comments you're not afraid of their opinions you're not afraid of the backlash if you love me you will stand if you love me you will shout if you love me you will decree what I love I'm not talking about individuals that had abortion and there's individuals in this room that you've had abortion. And I want to let you know we call this church the mercy culture because there's no sin that outweighs the love of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God. Listen, he didn't run away from you because your sin. He ran towards you because of your sin. I'm not talking about you. And don't worry, we've all sinned as much as you. Scripture says gossip's an abomination. The church is guilty. We're talking about a war that's on righteousness. Church, what is joy-based warfare? Mark, come play with me on the piano. What is joy-based warfare? Joy-based warfare is when you celebrate what God is celebrating. Citizens for Life, we're at the starting point with Lou Engle and the Fords and Dr. Brown and Pastor Zane and true champions and generals, thousands of people. And I'm at the front of the line and I'm like amped up. Ron, I'm ready to charge for battle. I'm like, this is gonna be spiritual warfare. Bring it, bring bring the anxiety, bring the witchcraft, bring the spirit, let's go. I'm on the front. Bring it, devils. And some really little girls go out first. with flags. And then the worshipers go. And Sean's yelling joy. Pastor Jazz is yelling joy. I see Jalen dancing in the streets of Dallas. And I, I was ready for war but I only felt joy. And I'm watching children dance, people sing. 
I don't know how long that was, but we danced for miles. I didn't feel any resistance. I just felt joy. I believe that's what we're going to feel for the next 18 to 24 months. <laughs> Pastor, are you saying it's going to be easy? I'm saying hard things become easy in his presence. <laughs> Pastor, are you saying we're not going to go through trials? We wish. I'm saying we're going to rejoice always. And again, we're going to rejoice. I'm telling you this, that you're being invited into a season of joy-based warfare where you will participate in unprecedented joy. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes all over this place? There is no joy without salvation. Luke says, all of heaven rejoices when the one comes home. You're the one today. This morning, if you need salvation, if you're in sin, if you need mercy, if you need Jesus this morning, wherever you are, I'm not going to invite you to the front. I'm not going to send you in the back room. This is you and God right now. Just lift your hands and just say, Jesus, I need your mercy. I need your mercy. If there's any sin in your life, watching online, listening to the podcast, online campus, Mercy Culture Communities, in the balconies, wherever you are in this place, do not miss this place. Don't miss this moment to invite the King of Joy into your life and into your heart. There's no special way to pray. There's not even a biblical salvation prayer. It's just saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I believe. It's faith in grace right now. Just tell him, I believe you're God, and I need your forgiveness. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to change me. I need your mercy. I need your grace. Jesus, I need you. There's two kinds of people in this room. Some like me that you struggle with joy. And if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, stand your feet and lift your hands right now if you struggle with joy, if you struggle, if you struggle, if you struggle like me, just stand your feet. The other kind of people, you're like Heather, that your joy has been attacked. Your joy has been attacked. If that's you and you say, Landon, my joy has been attacked, stand your feet and lift your hands all over this place. Stand your feet and lift your hands. I declare right now, Lord, give us a revelation of joy. Give us a revelation of joy. Give us a revelation of joy. Come on, just ask him for it right now. Ask him for joy. Ask him for joy. I pray right now, let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy, come on, I just start praying it right now. Start saying it with me right now. Come on, we're praying a prayer of dunamis. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Come on, pray. The joy of the Lord be our strength.
on the stage. If you're a man who's on the worship team, come on the stage. Here's what I heard the Lord say. I heard the Lord say that a layer of fear would be shed off of you. All right, this is funny. Leap and twirl, men. Leap and twirl, men. Let it break off. Let it break off. Let it break off. Let it break off. Now somebody shout. I don't know what this looks like, <laughs> but I heard the Lord say this, now give me the undignified praise. Would you just close your eyes all over this place? Keep kicking, keep kicking that truck, kick up. Ask him to show you right now what does the undignified praise look like? 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 What is the, I will make myself more undignified. I will make myself humiliated. I will make myself more. I want the pleasure of the Lord. The pleasure of the Lord.
your hands as high as they go all over this place. Here's what I heard. From this day forward, you are never going back. We will not fight. We will not expand territory. We will not do one day without his joy. I feel like I'm supposed to declare it over you again. I declare that you and your family, I declare mercy culture, we are never going as high as they go and breathe in the presence of God. Come on, breathe it in. Oh, Mark's on the keys. Breathe in the presence of God. Declare the night is over and sorrow may last for the night, but I declare right now the deliverance of joy to come on you right now. I declare the deliverance of joy. I declare joy that comes in the morning. I declare that you will laugh again like Heather testified. I declare you will laugh again. I declare joy from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. I declare joy in your rooms of your home. I declare joy on your children. I hear that, pastors, it's going to be a joy to build the house of God again. It's going to be a joy to serve again. It's going to be a joy to go to war again. I declare 18 to 24 months of unprecedented joy in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout and give the Lord a hand. Who feels freer in the world today? Ooh. Isn't freedom the most beautiful thing? <laughs> That's what he does every time that he comes. Thank you, Jesus. The shackles <laughs> were broken today. I heard also as Lena was declaring what what would be a joy that parenting would be a joy there was a lightness coming to fathers and mothers in the room that have struggled in parenting part of it has been a warfare of questioning am i doing this wrong and fear-based warfare 
thinking that your children were going to fall away from the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your mercy that joy is returning to marriages, that joy is returning to our children, that joy is returning to parenting and raising our children up in your ways, King. So Father, we thank you for the miracles, signs and wonders that were done in this room. And I declare, let it continue. Let it continue from this place, outside of this place. Oh, do you know that men, there's something powerful when men begin to walk in the rightful place, the word of God says that you are the head of your household and the head of you is King Jesus. <laughs> Today you came back in union with your head, King Jesus, which means there's nothing in the way for his authority ruling and reigning through you. I saw also some of you going back into your households and beginning to declare what crooked ways were there yesterday, that they were becoming straight, praying over your wife, over your children, over your households, and purifying your household. So Father, I thank you that today, what was done in these men is sealed with the blood of Jesus. I thank you what was done in this house today is sealed with the blood of Jesus. We come into unity with the word that Landon said, we are never going back. We are not going back to Christians that are in bondage, oppressed and depressed. But I declare over these men, the joy of the Lord shall be their strength. So Lord, today we give you all of that glory. And I thank you testimony after testimony, glory after glory will come forth of what you did today. Glory to glory. Men, you're gonna dance like this in your house. <laughs> you're gonna dance like this in your businesses. You're gonna dance like this in the midnight hour and the early morning hours and your kids are gonna get up and say, what are you doing? Come dance with me, Father, I thank you. From glory to glory, you are taking the sons and daughters of this house in your presence. Hmm. Even just heard the Lord say that yesterday what overwhelmed you, yesterday what you thought was a pitfall or a mess up, I heard when Landon was preaching that the sufferings were opportunities. See, some of you have think you have gone on det detours or you have missed things or it has taken too long. Your sufferings are opportunities for the gospel to go forth, for the authority that he has placed within you to go forth. So Father, we even praise you this morning for the sufferings. And Father, I thank you that faith has risen this morning to see their situations differently, to not curse their situations. Oh, but that it's an honor and a joy to suffer for you, King Jesus. Thank you that you have turned mourning into dancing, and mourning into joy today. So I declare that we will dance throughout the rest of this week. We love you, Jesus. We say thank you. Thank you. Can we just give him an applause? Say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. day in his presence <laughs> what a beautiful day well um, like the transitions like this when you're just in his presence and glory they're always awkward so the three ways to give are all on the screen
If you need prayer for anything at all, there'll be our prayer team that's down here. But can we spread some joy this week? Can we spread it? I think Fort Worth needs some joy. Dallas needs some joy. Your neighborhood needs some joy. So spread it this week. We love you so much, Mercy Culture. I'm gonna bless you out with Exodus 33, 13. Lord, teach us your ways that we may know you and find your favor. We love you so much, Mercy Culture. Blessings to you.